as it is taken to the flame and to the fire, the offerer will pour a measure of wine over it. So let's track now in Numbers 15, verses 8 to 10. Numbers 15, verses 8 to 10. And God says to the Israelites, when you prepare a young bull as a burnt offering or a sacrifice for a special vow or for fellowship offering to the Lord, bring with the bull a grain offering of three tenths of an ephah of the finest flour mixed with a hem of olive oil. Also bring half a hem of wine as an offering. And this will be a food offering, a sweet aroma pleasing unto the Lord. Amen. Amen. Now a lot of South Africans think they invented this idea of having a bride. You put some chops on and you pour some nice castle lava over it. No, you didn't invent that. God is way ahead of us. Amen. And people today in cultures like to argue about who was sophisticated first in the kitchen. The Chinese claim it's them. Indians claim it's them, the Italians claim it's them, but over 4,000 years ago, God told people and showed them how to cook their food. He said, bring the offering to the fire, put it with fine flour. When you make a oxtail, don't you flour it first? Sister Lily? Yes. This is the Bible. No, Sister Denise didn't teach you that. I found it in the Bible. It was in the Bible. And then mix it, and then you put wine with your oil. You thought you invented it. It was in the Bible. Amen. Amen. So we don't mind you having a bride. Just don't make the stuff. Eh? Just put it over the bride. Amen. I've got a lot of amen, so I feel good. Amen. So this is how God said to they were to do it. Now, if you've done this, now, I'm not trying to be illuminated for joking for no reason. But you've done your bride, you've put your wine over it. Get that nice sound. Amen. Come on, okay. If you say yes, I'm not going to rebuke you and hold you on to repent. You know what I'm talking about? It smells nice. Now that's what God was saying. When you prepare it right, it's a sweet smelling <coughs> savor unto the Lord. It's not just something burning to a crisp on the fire. It's a sweet smelling savor. But you had to put the, the drink offering came last. And the drink offering was what encapsulated the whole offering unto God. Now that was in the Old Testament. Are you following with me? Now this was seen in the New Testament as well. In the Philippian sacrificial service, Paul saw the converted Christians who offered their lives and everything they had sacrificially and faithfully done to the service of God. And Paul said, watch this now, I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith. Are you understanding this? Let me, try, let me help you understand this before we move on. So, so, so going back into the Old Testament, they couldn't simply put a drink offering on the fire. That wouldn't work out. That wouldn't work out. You had to have something, the young bull. It had to be prepared with a measure of flour and with oil. And when it was ready to be placed on the sacrificial altar, it was then placed. And then finally the drink offering was poured over it. Now Paul says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We are not living in the Old Testament. We don't offer up bulls and, and lambs and, and birds and doves. But we, you and I, become the sacrificial offering to God according to Romans 12. Submit, sacrifice your bodies as a living sacrifice to God. And then Paul says, watch this, I am being poured out over you. And together, your sacrifice with me being poured over you becomes a sweet smelling savor unto God. And that is what we are doing in the services. That's what we are doing in our worship. You are bringing the sacrifice of praise, the sacrifice of worship, and more importantly, yourself. Presenting it before God on the sacrificial altar. And we are pouring the sweet wine over it. And it becomes a sweet smelling savor unto God. Amen. Are we getting this this morning? This imagery is so powerful and so beautiful. And this all refers to sacrificial ministry among the Philippian church. By showing them the way of salvation through the testimony of the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he was saying, I am being poured out over you. He says, even if I'm poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice <clears throat> and the gist of your faith, he says, I rejoice. I rejoice. Now, I'm going to give you the gist of the message. Where are we going with this message? And then we just quickly get into it. Paul says in one portion of scripture, I am being poured out. So our life as Christians is not one Sunday, 
where you are poured out. It's not one sacrificial act of being poured out. It's a continual act. You saw the pit that we had for you. It shows the glass lying on that side and it's continuous <coughs> pouring out. That is the imagery you need to take with you. We as Christians are not retaining what we have inside of us. We are pouring it out as unto Him because He is worthy of our service and our sacrifice and He is, and we are pouring this out. We are pouring out our lives unto Him non-stop. Amen. Do you see that? And so Paul says, I'm being poured out. So he says, I am being poured out. And then Paul reaches the stage where he writes to his audience and he says, I am already poured out. Everything I have in me, I have poured it out. I have not kept back anything. I have not retained anything. I have not put anything in reserves. I have lavishly and freely poured it all out. And that is what he's trying to communicate to us as Christians as well. And we are to follow his example. He said, I fought the good fight. I have finished the course and I have kept the faith. And you see this portion of scripture and where we're going coincides with the last song you sang, I have decided to follow Jesus. When you decide to pour yourself out or pour the drink offering, you don't turn the glass over and say, no, I'll say I poured it for myself. It's poured out. Your life is like a glass tumbler being poured out. You don't turn it over at age 50, 60 and say, no, I'll say something for myself. He is worthy. And so we pour everything out over him and over our service and commitment. Amen. Now we're getting this this morning. Praise the Lord. So let's get into the message. Around about now, we'll just have that two, just to set some ambiance. Of your God. 
He's saying, you are not giving me. You are not pouring out these offerings. You're not bringing the offering. You're not bringing the drink offerings to me. And what we need to see here in Philippians 2 verse 17 is that Paul was comparing his life to this drink offering that the Bible speaks about. And he says, I am being poured out as a drink offering. He compared himself to the glass of wine. And just as wine is poured out on the altar of sacrifice, he saw his life as being poured out as a sacrifice for the Lord's work. And he had no regrets. He says, I have no regret. I gladly do it. He's pouring out his life for the Lord's work. Amen. Let me take you to another portion of scripture that just ministered to me this week as well, as I was reflecting upon this message. It's found in 2 Samuel chapter 23, verses 15 to 17. 2 Samuel chapter 23, verses 15 to 17. So David is in one of those many battles of the Philistines. Okay, you understand these associations in the Bible. David, Philistine, just think that and you're on the right track. So David is one of those many battles of the Philistines. And at one point, David is so tired and he's so thirsty, he says longingly, oh, that someone would bring me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem that is by the gate. And by then, three men, three of David's men, broke through the camp of the Philistines, drew water from the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate, and carried it and brought it to David. He expressed his wish, and three men literally risked their lives fighting the many big, fierce Philistines, broke their way through, filled their canteens with water from the well of Bethlehem, and brought it back to David and they presented it to him without him knowing what they were doing. And when David saw this, and when David took receipt of the water, the canteen of water, and he realized what his men had gone through to do this for him, David did the following. He turned the canteen over and he poured it out. And he said, he poured it out. He would not drink of it because he poured it out unto the Lord. And the men that were with him were not offended that their leader, their future king, had taken something so precious that they had received from their hands, that they had labored to bring to him. They were not offended that he took it and he just poured it out in front of them. They understood what a drink offering was all about. Track with me. They understood the honor of having their hard won water poured on the ground as a drink offering to God. Amen. Because they risked their lives. But it was by God's grace that three men were able to do the impossible. It's like me sending you to the Ukraine right now to go and get me some olive oil, get me something precious. You would have to risk that warfare or the Middle East and go get it and bring it back for me. And so Paul and uh, David understood this and the men that uh, performed this wonderful sacrifice understood that it was only God's grace that enabled them to do what they did. David felt he had received an offering appropriate only for God himself. See, listen to this. We fight for God, but not for the king. We fight for God, but not for the people. And that's what David was trying to get them to see. You're not fighting for me. You are fighting for the Lord. Because sometimes people get confused in warfare. People get confused in church circles. David was saying to them, you're not fighting for me. You are fighting for the Lord. And therefore this precious container of water, because it was, for some reason, the well of Bethlehem was very nice. The water probably was sweet. I don't know. So it was valuable. It was precious. And he poured it out. And he said, this is a drink offering to God. So he took that which was precious. And instead of consuming it on himself, he poured it out unto the Lord. Isn't that a picture that we should take with us? David's libation said that the water was a worthy offering of the Most High God, and that David was, and that God was worthy of the priceless water. Ah, what David did there. Can you see that? That is why when the Israelites came to the Promised Land, their first challenge was to take down the walls of Jericho, or to defeat Jericho, the city of Jericho. But in order to do that, they had to bring down the walls of Jericho. And so God calls them to circle the city six times. And on the seventh time, with the, with the blowing of the shofars and the trumpets and the shout of victory from the people, the walls simply fell down. 
And so God said, when you enter the city, you shall not take anything for yourself. All the plunder, the riches, and the wealth belongs to God. But when they entered the city, one man by the name of Achan took a portion of gold and silver and valuable clothing and he hid it in his tent. And then God says, someone has troubled all Israel. And when Joshua investigated why they lost the battle of Ai, God showed them that it was a man by the name of Achan who had taken the forbidden stuff and consumed it upon himself. You see, what God was saying to them, the victory of giving you a Jericho, you did not do it. Joshua, it was not you. Yes, you are strong. Yes, you are fearless. But it was not your military powers that obtained you this victory. It was my doing. I gave you the victory. You barely lifted up a sword and the walls fell down and the enemy fled from before you. I gave you the victory. Therefore, the spoils belong to me. And if you will honor me in the beginning of your entry into the promised land, I will give you 90% of the land. Just give me this 10%. Mm-hmm. And that's what God says to us without hiding. I'll get to that in just a little while. You see? So when the wolves come out, God was saying to them, I'm doing this, not you. Therefore, take the spoils and give it to me. And in the same way, we have to take our lives and pour it up. And God said, this is my life. I did this, I earned this, I, 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 and there's no I, I, I. So make Christ, Christ, Christ in this situation. And it's all because of Him that you are saved. It's all because of Him that you are living so long. It's all because of Him that you have the health that you have. It's all because of Him that you have the wealth that you have. So be willing to pour it out without reservation, without trying to retain anything unto yourself. So God said the first battle that you win, you will take the spoils and it's for me because God wanted it for the temple. But he said the 90% I will give you, all the gold and silver will be yours. Just don't touch this. This is mine. But they will not this man. So Paul was ready to go to any extent. And he said I'm willing to be poured out. Not 90% but 100%. Amen. What sacrificial love that was. So that is a drink offering unto the Lord. Secondly, the inevitable. Paul goes on to write in Philippians 4 verse 9. He says, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. He says, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. So Paul wasn't just giving them an example and a little portion of scripture. He goes on to say, what you have seen in me, you must learn to do it as well. So we call the section the inevitable. The question you might ask this morning is what is the inevitable? And the inevitable is this, that we should practice the things that we have seen in the Apostle Paul's life. That means that we are to imitate what he did. That we should allow our lives to be used by God, spent, poured out for the kingdom of God's sake. Amen. The Apostle Paul uses the simile as a figure of speech to explain to his listeners that he is ready and willing to give up his life as a drink offering. He also said that he would rejoice and be glad to do so as long as it would deepen their faith and their love for Christ and to provoke them to more service in God. To provoke them to more service in God. He said, be followers of me as I am a follower of Christ. Which means that we are not just following the Apostle Paul's example, but we are following Jesus Christ's example as well. It implies that in this life, in this life, people might say you have a right to certain things. You have a right to certain assets, possessions and pleasures. You have a right to certain breakthroughs in life. But we might have to sacrifice those things for the sake of the kingdom of God and for the glory of God. That's why the book of Hebrews exhorts us to provoke one another, to consider one another, to provoke one another to love and to good works. You see, when you provoke someone, you get an appropriate response out of them. Ever had your children do this? Those that have raised children, Moms that are still raising children, the children come 
fighting and crying back to you as a mom or a dad, and then the little child will say, no, he's doing this, he's teasing me, he's pulling my ponytails, that type of thing. That's what it means to provoke. When you provoke someone, you get a response from them. If you don't get a response, you haven't provoked them enough. So Paul uses the word provoke. The word provoke means to get a response. And the response means to do what we're telling you to do. And that's why he's doing and saying what he's saying. He's provoking them to follow his example. Amen. So he says in Romans 1 11, I long to see you that I may impart some spiritual gift to you to make you strong. Hallelujah. To make you strong. Round about now, lift your hands and pray this with me. Say, Lord, Lord. forgive me forgive for being so self centered that I overlook other people's needs. I get so caught up with my own problems that I forget I am not the only person in the world who is struggling with a situation. Help me to take my eyes off myself and to look around and see who needs some encouragement. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. And the third example that we share this morning with you, I'm going to share with you in summation of this idea and this theme and this message is this Are you willing to be poured out? Are you willing to be poured out? I said all of that to bring us to this point. This is the crux of the matter, the crux of the message on which this whole message hinges. I love Paul's wording. He says, I am ready to be poured out. He never ever speaks of his life with reservation, limitation, or with grace on. He's always so ready. He says, I'm ready to be poured out. Now, like we said earlier, I am being poured out as a drink offering, and then Paul eventually says, I am being, I am already poured out. The time of my departure is at hand. And this is our lives in a nutshell. Now here's the question. When you look back on your life, what are you going to rejoice in having done? Are you going to talk about how much of money you have made? What kind of promotion you received? in life, how many things you accumulated in life, your joy when your life is over is only going to be found in the ways you pour out your life for the Lord. That is what will come to eternity. That is what will come to life. It's not the material things, and we're not saying the material things are not important, but you must be careful that you're not placing too much of focus an emphasis on those things which will perish with time. Are you ready to be poured out? That's the question. Paul said, I am ready to be poured out for you. Are you ready to be poured out like sands through the hourglass? What is your life being poured over or poured out for? What are you focusing on? Hallelujah. He says, I'm ready to be poured out. Now, let me just share some nuggets with you as we wrap things up. So, we know that the drink offering is wine. Wine was poured over the offering. We know that the drink offering is wine. We read the portion of scripture. Now, wine speaks about merriment and enjoyment. Isn't that what it represents in the Bible? The Bible says that wine makes glad the heart of man. So that in essence is to yield up the pleasures for the kingdom of God. Matthew 6.33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. If I had to rephrase that, I would say, Put the kingdom first. Would you be happy with that? Put the kingdom first. So Psalm 104.15 says, Wine makes glad the heart Typically speaks of that which cheers God and it cheers man. Now in this there is a beautiful picture of tithing. I want to tie it up and bring it back to what I said about tithing earlier on. Remember David poured out the drink offering. Even though he needed it, even though he was thirsty, he poured it out and he realized it's to God be the glory. Amen. So what 
houses. Here's a beautiful picture of tithing in this whole thing. And we bring it together with this. Are you following? Watch this. Instead of wine giving me joy by me drinking it, I in turn take it and I pour it out on the offering for God. Are you getting this? Instead of the wine giving me joy, I pour it out. And this is what you're saying to God. I am giving you joy. I am giving you my joy. I take joy in what brings you joy, Almighty Father. That's why God says He loves a cheerful giver. And Paul constantly reminded his audience to rejoice in the Lord. To rejoice in the Lord. The amount of wine always corresponds with the amount of oil accompanying the meal offering. So the Holy Spirit leads you to give a sacrificial offering and it's released with joy. Paul says, I am filled with the gift that I have received from Epa, Froditus, the things that came from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well pleasing to God. So let's wrap this up and bring it together. Instead of drinking wine that brings you joy, the wine is poured out unto God. And you're saying, I am sacrificing my joy for your pleasure. May you take joy in the thing that would have given me joy. We bring that together with your tithing and your sacrificial offering which you bring to the house of God. And you're saying, instead of this bringing me pleasure, because there's lots of things I could do with this 10%. You say, Lord, I'm surrendering it to you. May you take pleasure in this, not me. I get my pleasure from surrendering my pleasure to you. And God finds that well pleasing. God finds that well pleasing. When you surrender your pleasure for his pleasure, your joy for his joy. Amen. Are we seeing this? See, God never asks for equal giving, but for equal sacrifice. And we must realize to the extent that we pour ourselves out, allowing ourselves to be poured out, we will become like Apostle Paul, a drink offering poured out for the sake of God's glory in this world. And remember what Jesus said in closing friends this morning, he who wishes to save his life will lose it, but he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Spend your life in serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And it will be an investment that will last forever in eternity. Remember what God says again. As the word of God says, I has not seen, nor ear heard, what God has in store for those that love him. Lift your hands and say this with me. See, dear Father, grant me the courage to pour out my life for you in a powerful and meaningful way. Take me and feed me as bread to the nations. In Jesus' name, amen.